Hello and welcome to Sports Exercise and Health Sciences for IB. Today we're looking at our first topic, topic number one, anatomy. And more specifically today in this vodcast, we're looking at the skeletal system. For the IB course, the objectives are pretty simple. We've got to distinguish anatomically between the axial and appendicular skeleton, distinguish between the axial and app appendicular skeleton in terms of function, state the four types of bones, draw and annotate the structure of a long bone, apply anatomical terminology to the location of bones, outline the functions of connective tissue, define the term joint, distinguish between the different types of joints in relation to movement permitted, and outline the features of a synovial joint. So to begin with, the musculoskeletal system is made up of, a, of the skeletal system, which is all the bones and joints of the body, and the muscular system, which contains all the muscles. When two or more bones come together, they form a joint. Muscles cross these joints and pull on the bones, causing the body to move at the joint. And to understand how the muscles and bones of the body allow you to perform all the physical actions of daily life, it is important to know about the location and structure of specific muscles and bones, and to understand how they work together. So, the first thing we need to talk about is the anatomical terminology. This is obviously a language to talk to and used by um, people in reference to the body so that we can understand where we're talking about and how we are talking about things in relation to one another. So, for example, the body is, has, many sub, has many structures, um, for example, the thigh and the upper arm, and we need to describe where those structures might be. So we're talking about the terms such as anterior, posterior, inferior, superior, superficial or deep, and, and those sorts of things. Um, you should have it in your OneNote guide, uh, a list of those anatomical positions and, and anatomical p um, terminology. And remember that when we talk about anatomical terminology, we normally talk about in reference to the anatomical position or the fundamental position. Normally, if it's not, if nothing's mentioned, then we're talking, we're talking specifically about the anatomical position. If a, a certain position is need needing to be considered, that would be mentioned in the question. All right, our skeletal system has several functions. First is the protection of vital organs. So we can think about the rib cage surrounding the heart and lungs, the, the skull enclosing the brain, even the pelvis protecting the reproductive organs to a degree, and also the vertebrae surrounding the spinal cord. It obviously supports and maintains our posture. We've talked about already that the larger bones are, tend to be found lower down in the body or more inferior to the other parts of the body because obviously they're carrying a greater amount of the load so they need to be bigger and stronger. So we would expect our inferior lumbar vertebrae to be much bigger than our superior cervical vertebrae for example. Our bones provide attachment points for the muscles. Remember muscles attach to bones via tendons and the bones provide roughened areas or enlarged areas to provide attachments for those tendons. It's also a place where minerals such as calcium and, and phosphorus are stored and when required those minerals are released into the bloodstream to be transported around the body. In the cancerous tissue of our long bones is where red blood, blood cells are created. Red blood cells are very, very important for the transport of oxygen around the body which is incredibly important for energy production, for muscular movement. And so the, the blood cell production part of, of bone function is an incredibly important part for our body to function well, particularly when we talk about athletic pursuits. And finally, it's also a place where we store energy. Uh, the medullary cavity in the centre or in the shaft of a long bone is a, a cavity where marrow is stored and in that marrow is essentially made up of fat. Uh, and fat is very, very energy dense, particularly in comparison to carbohydrates or protein and therefore it can provide a lot of energy for muscular movement when required. The skeletal system itself uh, accounts for about 20% of our body weight and it's made up of not just the bones but also the cartilage which is found at the ends of all the bones where the bones articulate with other bones or where they are together with other bones. Uh, it also includes the ligaments and tendons and also includes all the joints of the body. Um, there are 206 bones in our human skeleton but we don't need to remember all 206 names because many of the bones that we're going to be discussing actually only need to be remembered as the same name. For example, the ribs, there are 24 ribs and we just need to know them as ribs. Uh, for the vertebrae, there are, there are many, many ribs, 30 odd in fact, but we only need to know them about in their five sections, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum and coccyx. Our fingers and toes each have individual names. We just need to know them collectively as phalanges. So there's a lot of bones that we need to know 
but really we only need to know them we only need to know a, a small amount of the 206 specifically uh, the appendicular skeleton contains 126 bones the same sort of situation there in regards to how much we need to know and uh, obviously the the shoulder girdles and the pelvic girdles are responsible for joining our appendicular skeleton to our axial skeleton but those girdles are considered to be part of the appendicular skeleton here in this diagram you can see that the appendicular skeleton is highlighted in blue where I'm moving the cursor around and the axial skeleton is highlighted in the pink color the axial, axial skeleton if we just track back we've got our skull we've got our thoracic cage our ribs and our sternum and also our vertebrae their primary role is for protection of major organs our skull for example is protecting our brain and protecting our eyes it's also a point of attachment for our teeth there's no muscles there's no tendons there's no ligaments holding our teeth in place it's simply teeth wedged into the bone tissue um, also protects our ears as well yes we know there's part of our ears that isn't protected that's just fluffy cartilage but obviously the ear canal where the sound and, and where the important bones and structures for for hearing are are located is actually deep inside our skull so our skull plays an important protective role there when we talk about again bones that we don't need to know you can see here all the different colors are representative of different bones we just need to know them essentially as the skull so it makes life easy for us the vertebral column is made up of 33 bones stacked one on top of the other. All right, it's, a, it's a pretty solid and, and very flexible. Here, if we look at this vertebral column, where I have the cursor at the moment is the back of the, vertebrae, of the vertebral column. So that's sort of where the, the skin of the back would be. Now I'm at the front of the vertebral column, so this is probably where our, our stomach is going to be, and out where my cursor is now is probably where the skin of the chest would be if we were going to scale. These first seven here, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, the next 12, and then the next five, all have a cartilage disc in between each vertebrae. That's represented by the, the white disc or the white um, sash, I guess, in between each vertebra in, in between each vertebrae. That is cartilage, it's there for shock absorption and, and to ensure that the bones aren't rubbing against each other, and it makes the movement of the spine a lot more simple a lot easier and certainly less chance of damage to the bone tissue itself the first seven are the vertebrae of our neck uh, they are a lot smaller because they're not carrying a great deal of load it's simply the the skull and then the weight of each of these vertebrae so they don't need to be very big they're not really held in position too strongly other than the ligaments joining the the bones together and the ligament and the tendons attaching muscles to these bones and because they're not held in too fixed a position it does allow significant amount of movement and that's why our neck can twist so much the next 12 are our thoracic vertebrae and they're joined um, to a rib on either side so there'd be a rib um, coming from here and there'd also be a rib coming from the other side of the vertebrae which we can't see in this side on view um, each of these vertebrae is connected to a rib or two ribs in fact and so because there's 12 ribs it makes sense that there are 12 thoracic vertebrae as we can see as we descend down the vertebral column the the vertebrae are getting bigger and bigger the lumbar vertebrae are our biggest vertebrae you can see there that the the size of one of these vertebrae is almost the equivalent of, of two of these upper thoracic and, and probably three of these cervical vertebrae not only are the bones bigger but also the cartilage discs in between the bones are also bigger and that stands to reason as well we need bigger bones to take on bigger loads but we also need bigger discs to take on bigger loads as well um, these vertebrae are fixed in the fact that they're they're wedged between the thoracic and the lumbar they don't provide a great deal of rotational ability but they do handle significant amount of load the final two sections are our sacrum and our coccyx the sacrum is made up of five, sorry, five vertebrae, and our coccyx is made up of four. However, it's, it's almost like a prehistoric remnant of our tail in the fact that it really is only one bone, and the coccyx is another bone. But we still consider it to be five vertebrae because there's still the spiny processes 
of five vertebrae still remaining on the sacral and also on the coccyx for when they were individual vertebrae. So we call these vertebrae fused vertebrae in the fact that there is no ligaments holding them together and there is no cartilage disc in between them. Instead, it's essentially five bones fused into one and then for the coccyx, four bones fused into one. I hope that makes sense. Continue on with the axial skeleton and more to do with the vertebrae. Each vertebrae looks something like this when we look from the top down and looks like this when we look from the side on. As I mentioned before, this section here and this section here is the part that's closest to the skin of the back. This section here is the area where the spinal cord runs through. Sitting on top of this space, which is this space here as well, is where the cartilage disc would be. Also beneath that space as well. The cartilage disc obviously doesn't move into this area here because then it would be blocking the path of the spinal cord. However, if we do slip a disc or herniate a disc, that's where we've ruptured the disc and, and put a cut in it essentially, the fluid that's inside the disc will start to ooze out. There's every chance that that, that fluid, which is written down here, the nucleus propulsus, might actually start to move into this area and therefore place pressure on the spinal cord. In its initial stages it might be irritation, it could, it could lead to feelings of pain and even feelings of pins and needles or even loss of feeling if it completely puts, if it puts so much pressure on the nerve that the nerve is actually not able to transmit the information properly. So that's obviously the, the dangers of, of slipping a disc. Usually resting is the best way to recover from a slipped disc um, because we can't continue to exercise because then it gives no chance or opportunity for the, the cut in the disc to actually heal. To continue to exercise also might mean that because there's less shock absorption now in our split disc or our herniated disc, it puts more load or a greater percentage of load on the other discs which then makes injuring those discs an even more likely scenario and so we can go from having no slip discs to having one and trying to tough on through it and, and, and battle through and then quickly having two or three slip discs because of the increased load on the, the still AOK -okay discs. Um, as we mentioned we've got our cervical in our neck, we've got our thoracic with the ribs attaching to them and our lumbar playing the, the high weight um, loading position. All right, we continue here with this and we talk about our cervical, we talk about our spinal curves. Our cervical curve, um, our thoracic curve, our lumbar curve, and then our obviously our, our sacral and coccyx curve or coccygeal curve. These two, the thoracic and the sacral coccygeal curves are what we call our primary curves because they're there as soon as the fetus begins developing. Normally, or, or, or almost in 100% of occasions, probably 100%, the fetus develops in a tucked up position, almost the, the idea of if you were lying on the ground with your um, knees to your chest and your chin to your chest, and that's why it's called the fetal position because it's the position that the, fetal, that the fetus is in. So these curves are already present because the spine is in a permanent curve when in that position. The cervical curve doesn't exist until the baby, once it's born, starts to try and lift its head. So at birth, this, this area here would actually be dead straight. Same with this area here, the lumbar area would be dead straight. This curve starts to develop, as I said, when the baby starts to lift its head. This curve here starts to develop once the, the baby starts to walk. When we talk about our axial skeleton, we also talk about our ribs and sternum. Uh, and they obviously play an important role in protecting the heart and lungs. We can see here there's significant amounts of cartilage which allows for much more movement in the cage which is really important obviously for breathing because the cage expands outwards when we breathe in and it collapses inwards when we breathe out. And so obviously if it had no movement available to it, it would make the expansion and contraction of the lungs very, very difficult.